Sorry, we can't hear Liz as loudly as we should, so we're going to work on this for a second. Um, this is on. Okay, you're on. I'm on now? Yeah. You, okay. um, yeah, offer solutions. Say yes. And we have a tendency to over say yes. Be decisive. Be creative. <laughs> that one's more true than you think. Be a great team player. So that's kind of the um, now the reality. I want you to read this. Can, it, can everyone see that I could or would you read it out? Okay. Oh, I'll read it. I suck at most things. It rules me out of almost any normal job. I don't get office power of politics. I blunder constantly by saying what I think. I have a memory like a sieve. Anything process or systems related, forget it. I can't sit still on focus. A desk is a jail. Highly emotional like a war nerd. I feel others pain. I don't know about anybody else in this room, but I can relate to that. I want to see That's what it can feel like. So the theories around this, as you probably all know, is this is kind of the, the, the group of things that's called neurodiversity. And my particular interest in is in neurodiversity at work. And as um, Jock was saying earlier, people quite often will have comorbidities as well with other um, either mental health issues or um, disabilities. So, it's quite interesting to think of that as more of a sort of overlap sometimes than necessarily as discrete things. I think one of the other things that we often talk about as well when we're talking about work for everybody, but especially I think for people with ADHD, is work life balance and what that looks like. And what we tend to do is we tend to put ourselves on one side and everything else on the other. And oddly enough, we feel overwhelmed because there's so much. And what I'd like you to do is think about working on balance slightly differently. It's actually all your life. Everything is all your life. It's not about little compartments where you suddenly become a different person and go off here to do whatever it is with your family and friends. And in my experience, what works really well is to also this colour really um, the is also thinking of these well, they're actually not for people. It's a bit like when you're in the plane going through the safety demonstration. Remember when they say, put your own oxygen mask on first? So if you don't look after yourself, especially when you've got ADHD, um, everything else is going to fall apart. It's, it's just, you're just not going to be able to sustain the energy, sustain the concentration, um, and keep everything afloat. So my advice would be that the big knee circle, that underpins everything else, and that needs to be solid. This is not about being um, selfish. This is not about saying, I'm going to pay far more attention to myself and go out shopping and you know, do all those things and you guys can all just get on with it. But it is about making sure you've got a big, solid, strong foundation. And as Sarah was talking about before, you know, there, are, there are ways that you've got to learn to self-soothe. There's ways for you to um, give yourself some strength and some resources to get through. And I'm very grateful to Sarah because she's done my whole talk about mindfulness. So, yeah. um, <laughs>
you are bringing an inappropriate social needs to you. And I was like, what are you talking about? Because being a chef, your entire social life is mixed up with being a chef because nobody else works those kinds of hours. You know, and everyone's been out with everyone else and everyone's you know, spending more time with everyone else. It's just a highly incestuous um, And so for me to learn that when I came to work, I wasn't supposed to bring my emotional needs. I was like, whoa. So I don't go to work. What she's saying is you don't go to work to get your um, self-validation. You don't go to work to um, feel the appreciation that you can give your parents when you're right. You know, it, it's work is work. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't care about work. It doesn't mean that you don't put effort in. It doesn't mean that you don't do what you need to do. But, but one thing that I've noticed with people, and especially um, when I'm dealing with people who are performance issues or, you know, not getting on very well, is they're often overly invested in work to a ridiculous degree so that, you know, their entire self-worth and everything that they think about themselves is caught up in work. So this is just my idea, you know, no, no one else has proved it or anything, but this is just my experience. So I found that if you put work where it needs to be, which is still an important part of your life, your eight hours a day or every five days a week, it's still an important part, but just don't give it any more worth than it needs. Go there, do 100%, leave. Get on with the rest of your life. Because at the end of the day, if you get a redundancy come up or something like that, it's going to hit you really hard if you're overly emotionally invested. And as Sarah was saying earlier, we feel a lot more than most people do. And so we will take it very personally. It, it can trigger, you know, people getting a bit more burning out and things like that. So I think that um, if you take nothing else away from today, take away um, from my speech, this, this model, just start to think about putting things into perspective. Because we tend to do everything at 120%. And that's not sustainable, but that's why we get overwhelmed, that's why things start to fall apart, etc. That was positive, wasn't it? Um, right. Now, the other thing I'm going to ask you to do, and it's got nothing to do with ADHD, I actually do this with everybody, um, managers, employees, all sorts of people, is about knowing yourself. It's really important that you know yourself. Now, okay, we've all got ADHD, we know what that brings with it, so emotions, dysregulation, all sorts of other bits and pieces. But there's also another side of it, because you are not your ADHD. And every single person in this room will have a different way that they like to work, a different way of seeing the world, um, a different way of experiencing the world. And you need to find out what that is and understand that about yourself. So there's various ways that you can do that. And I think one of the most powerful and easiest things that I've seen is what, um, it started off as a Myers-Briggs type indicator, but they've kind of gone a long way since then. And there's a website called 16 personalitycom and that is based on my address, but it's, um, it's been developed um, extensively, it's free. Um, if you join, you get a ton more tools, but yeah, it's free to join and they don't stand you, I promise. Um, and I um, So what you have is you ask a whole lot of questions and you find out what your type is. So does anybody here you know my address? Yeah, so you know what your type is. So I'm an ENTP. Um, um, and what that person is called there is the debater. So I'm that purple one in the middle there. And the, one of the strongest things about learning who you are is that you realise that there are 15 other types of people that aren't you. They're not you. And so when you start having problems with somebody, when you start to understand types, you go, oh. So they're not being difficult. They're not, um, they're just asking for something and they need something that you don't need. And so then it's just about learning about each other and trying to make them work together. So I'll give you some examples. Um, I'm not going to go into this in depth because um, it's way too complex and they can be their own So when I'm feeling great, this is what I am. Knowledgeable, quick thinker, original, fantastic at brainstorming, which is fantastic, some would say. Charismatic and energetic. So that's when I'm feeling really good. However, when I start to get stressed, very argumentative. So my, my love of conceptual discussion turns into bedding down to an opinion and, and arguing with people about it, getting a little bit slightly inappropriate. Um, I can be intolerant, so I just get sick of trying to work through things with people. So I do a lot of change management in my job. And change management is basically persuading people to do what you want. Um, but what it requires is a lot of listening. 
and a lot of understanding where people are at and then trying to um, help them to get to the place that you need them to be at to accept what you're trying to do. So um, if I'm not feeling that fantastic, don't let me be Which brings me to insensitivity. So, <laughs> and I can, I can get, and it's like I can just bark stuff out. So if you can imagine that as a type, as a person, I can be insensitive and bark stuff out, and then you add on my ADHD, I am the queen. Can find it difficult to focus, add on the ADHD, and just like practical matters, like just kind of off the board. So what this is getting you to understand is that there are there are, there are ways that you are as a person that underlie it, and everyone is like this to a greater or lesser degree. And then we go and wrap ADHD on top. So if you understand yourself, if you understand yourself as just a person, then you'll understand how you like to interact with the world, the things that people love about you, that you're really good at, what your strengths are, the things that other people find really annoying about you. Um, because let's face it, we all do need to know that stuff, but we're not going to go and ask someone, and we do go and ask someone, then we'll just do it. So let somebody like this to in a nice kind of safe way. The other great thing about um, this particular um, tool is that when you go in there, you can also see everybody else's types as well. So you start comparing yourself with other people as well, going, oh my god, you're a that, that makes complete sense. So I'd recommend that for you. Now, managing yourself. My thing is, ADHD isn't an excuse, but it is an explanation. Now, you were asking before about whether to disclose at work. Um, the legal answer is no, you don't have to disclose. Um, it's a disability, it's not an illness. Uh, it's legally classified as a disability, not an illness. So if you're getting discriminated at, uh, at work, because of your ADHD, it actually is a human rights matter, rather than, strictly speaking, and they have much bigger fines that go that way, rather than um, but it is discrimination on the basis of disability. However, if you don't tell the employer that you have a disability, it's very difficult to bring that up as a thing. Does that make sense? So my advice is disclose or don't disclose as you feel fit. Um, but I would also say it's not an excuse, it's an explanation. So with ADHD, well basically with, with employment, the basis of the, one of the very underlying tenets of employment law or any contract law is that you have to be able to do the job. So if you go into any contract, if you go into that contract legally, you go into it, you have to have the capacity to do it. So if you have ADHD and you're going to become uh, an air traffic controller, great hyperfocus. It's probably actually a really, really good thing. But it's not going to be a good thing if you work in retail on a Saturday because you need to be able to not hyperfocus. You know, so. It's horses to horses. And, and look, Sarah was saying this earlier as well, it's about your environment. So most people, the neurotypical people, can do most jobs. They can, and they're adaptable because they don't have that sensitivity that we have, the things that we can't cope with. We don't just get bored, we get mega disruptive bored. We get, you know, blow the place up because I'm bored. bored. You know? So most people can do a boring job because they know it's for the money and all the rest of it. We can't. So I think one of the first things I'd say to you is you've really, really got to know yourself and what you can and can't do. So me being a chef was a disaster because I was really good during service because it was very, very high action, fast paced and everything. I just about killed myself doing, um, it was doing prep, which is most of the days, that's a thousand day. You know, every single day you do exactly the same thing, trimming up the clothes, doing this, doing that, and it was just mind numbing. And um, so I think that you've really got to choose. I've been in HR for 25 years, and it's like, I love it every single day. still a lot of things. So that's where choosing the right thing for you. And that personality thing, they've got a lot of um, interesting information about what jobs you might be suitable for for that kind of time. So have, just have a look at that, have a explore. Go and see a career counselor, do some internet research to find out. So, but fitness in the job is the base is the basis to answer your question, is the basis of making the job. So um, I don't disclose um, at the beginning of the job, like I wouldn't put it down on the application being something that they need to be aware of because I manage it and it works for me because I know what I need to do. Um, but I also wouldn't go and work in a in a consultancy, for example, 
um, like a management consultancy because the pressure there is on sales and on billing and I know that I can do that. See, most people do it, I can't do it. I know that I don't have, so there are just days when I can't do sales and I just can't get out there, I haven't got confidence for it. And I also know I can't do the six months slots. It would just, it would be a disaster. So I just don't do that. If I make a mistake because of my ADHD, everybody makes mistakes, so that's not an issue. The, the issue is if you are in a job that requires you to not make mistakes, and you make way more than most people, um, and it can't be solved or mitigated, like if you weren't on medication, but you agreed to go on medication and your error rate went down, then you're actually not suitable to do the job. So you can't go to them and just say, well, I've got ADHD, live with it. They don't have to live with it because they need a job to. And they don't have to consider your ADHD. Yeah. Um, they have to make reasonable accommodation for it, but reasonable accommodation is providing you with some support, maybe suggesting you go to your doctor, but they can also require you, for example, to take medication. If the doctor says you need to take medication in order to be able to do this job well, they can say, well, your continuing employment depends on you following your doctor's advice, otherwise you're not fit for the job. It's a bit like if you, um, if you have uh, diabetes and you don't take your insulin, then I'm going to take you out of the truck driving job because you're going to call it. So, does that make sense? But how, where the fault is, so it's an explanation, not, a, not an excuse. Because the employer doesn't have to look at the crap performance or not turning up or taking loads of sick days because you can't place getting out of the duvet, out of, out of the duvet in the morning. Um, but some reasonable accommodation is to be made for it. Um, but again, it's like understanding yourself and finding the right job. So, first thing that you need to do is look after yourself. Really, really important, as we were talking about before, that work-life thing. You need to look after yourself. Stop worrying about everybody else and look after yourself. It's only when your, your battery is full. I always think of it as battery, right? So, the lower your battery gets, everything else goes up like that. The more full your battery is, everything else comes down like that. It's not that these things are changing, it's your perspective. These things aren't going up and down. Those things are always there. It's just that when your battery is full, there's a whole lot of things that you ought to be able to deal with. But um, you just don't even think of as an issue because you just deal with them or you ignore them or you move past them. Um, but when your battery gets low, everything becomes too much and then you get overwhelmed and it will be Choose your job wisely. This is what I was just saying before. Most people can do most jobs for a reasonable amount of time. We can't. <coughs> So, you know, when, uh, earlier on we were talking about um, not being able to sustain jobs and things. And um, for us, if we are going to be in a job that we hate, but we need to do it because it pays lots of money, or whatever it is, you know, that it's the only job that we can get at that time, or we're on a work visa, or we're stuck with that employer, then you have to start putting your attention elsewhere as to what's important to as Sarah said, how you're going to reward yourself and how you're going to keep yourself motivated. But don't keep looking for the job to do it. A job is a job. And you should enjoy it, but if you find the right fit and you know yourself and you start to understand others, you'll find that you can, you can do pretty much any job because everything becomes less of a problem. Everything is, is um, less constraining on you. Okay, you won't be able to read this probably. So learn to pause, and this is, thank you Sarah for the mindfulness lecture earlier. Really. So what this says is I'm meditating on my inability to meditate Due to the fact that when I meditate, I can't stop thinking about how I can't meditate because I'm thinking about my inability to meditate. Is that correct? <laughs> and if that's not a yes meditation, I don't know. So, um, actually, now, I'll tell you just a personal thing that's quite interesting is I learned to meditate when I was 12 because it was in the 70s and I lived in Devon Court. And everyone was happy then. That's before it got gentrified. And we were all happy. And, um, and, I learned, and I found it really easy. And everyone was going, oh my God. It's like, what, what is going on here? Because I just sit down and I meditate perfectly, you know, give the brain the whole thing. Hyperfocus. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we were saying hyperfocus is a gift. You can use it in this way too. And with mindfulness, the way that you start off by doing mindfulness, and it may progress to, progress to meditation or not, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. The thing with mindfulness about being in the now is all you have to do is start off with one second. 
So if you all take a breath in and, and, put a, and a breath out, and just concentrate on that breath. There you go, you just meditate. Now you only did it for one or two seconds, but what you've got to do is make it three or four seconds next time. Or five or six seconds, and you will get to a point where you can do it a lot. And for me, this has been one of the biggest tools that I've had, is the ability to do mindfulness. And um, I mean, I've been, I'm, I'm 53, so I've been here for a long time. But um, I, I've now kind of got a gap between me and the world, and that gap is mindfulness. And so mindfulness in its true form is actually constant meditation. It's like a constant gap between you and the world. It gives you time to, if your frontal cortex is not going to do the job for you, you've got to trip it into it with some other things. And this is why mindfulness is, is such a huge tool. That does. <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> Be consistent. So, it tastes good and it's guaranteed to improve memory, but I can't remember to take it. So, um, if you are on medication, take it consistently. And that taking it consistently will also give you some of the benefits of mindfulness as well. It gives you that gap to think. Um, if you get, I always put my keys by the white rabbit on the table that is by the front door that I put there specifically so that I don't lose my keys every day and the children get bollocked if they move my keys because they will go. So that's how that works. So set yourself up some little routines and set alarms and everything. So I want to go back to this quote that I gave you at the beginning and I want to show you, I hope, I actually invited the guy that did this, I actually invited him here but I didn't hear back so he's in this room, I love you. Um, this is a guy called Ruth Pilfrey, and he runs Real TV. And he's been doing that for a long time. He went to New York Studio School. He has done all of these jobs. TV director and producer, TV there, TV3, BBC, National Geographic. So he's no lightweight. He is a board member of the Screen Directors Guild, Eight Lots of Children Crackers, was his main achievement there. And he's been a judge at the Qantas Film and Television Awards. And you'll see from all of this, this is not stuff that he did for a month or two and then he got distracted. He's been doing this stuff for a long time. He's one prestigious guy. His education, New York Studio School, postgrad fine arts, got name. Bard College, New York, Bachelor of Arts, fine committee, got name. And this is what he says. I suck at most things. It rules me out of almost any more job. I don't get off as far as I do. I constantly by saying what I think. I have a memory like a sieve, any process or systems relations together. I can't sit still. Focus, I guess, is a jail. Highly emotional, like a warm nerve. I feel others' pain as my own. Hyper aware in a room, I can tell that the ant on the ceiling. <laughs> oh, my time is telling me I'm out of I'll stop that. Um, Cheryl from the house just took offence. I laugh at my own jokes. But I found one job that suits me. I walk into a business with a camera and improvise on how to capture its people, their essence, and tell an emotional story. Oblivious to power and politics, I can push CEOs into being real. That sounds like bullshit. Tell me what you really think and get a great answer. Shitty memory, I listen, watch, engage, capture on video. That's my memory. Can't sit still, my problem. I'm always moving with the action. To emotional, the flip side is empathy. I care and listen. People open up and share honestly. Hyper aware of a room, I'm the one person that know what six others are doing and can pivot. I know you can serve despite the protest, but see a clear manner. I'm in flow when I direct. Every floor has a silver lining. Embrace them. Now that guy is just like gold. He's me gold, so he's using the guy. And I'm actually contacting him because we need this little man in my hands. I thought so I think you need to follow this guy. He's Reuben Pillsbury, he's on LinkedIn. Have a look at what he does. And all of that inspirational video you saw at the very beginning, before Darren did the intro, it doesn't have to be a problem for you. It's just that our path is narrow. It's more specific. We have to look after ourselves a lot more. But we also have massive gifts that nobody else has. Everything he's talking about in there, I can go in and sort of say, of CEOs, I'm exactly the same. I can see exactly what's going on with politics in the room. I can't do the politics very well myself, but I can see exactly what's going on, and that's why I'm good at what I do. Um, so don't always look at it as a negative. Look up higher, don't get down in the detail. Know yourself and look after yourself. 
and you can send me emails and please if you I'll use the cards over there. If you want to send me emails, I'll specifically and um, I'm also going to chat um, with uh, Chris Thomas about actually putting together something about this subject. Thank you, Liz. Power of ADHD, yeah!